Okay, hello, good afternoon. Um, the people that they are not students of IAC, welcome here. Uh, today we have with us uh, Julian Vincent. Um, uh, Julian is a very good friend uh, of IAC. He has been uh, collaborating with IAC and he's always um, accepting our, our invitations for the last uh, three or four years. Uh, so we're very glad uh, that this time we have him here not only for a lecture but also for a more extensive workshop, uh, a workshop of two days that he's spending with the students. Uh, but uh, tonight he's concluding uh, his talks with uh, this public lecture and uh, I'm gonna read uh, some things about Julian and then himself he can add something if he wants. Uh, so, uh, Julian uh, Vincent uh, is a biologist, as most of you know. Uh, at the University of Reading, he studied the mechanical properties of plants and animals. He then moved to the University of Bath, where he became a professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineer, transferring functions from biology to engineer. He has been spent a lot of years in Bath. I think you're now a visiting professor or an associate Okay, uh, he is scientific advisor to Swedish uh, Biomimetics 3000, an independent company and consults on biological inspiration for architectural design. Uh, biology suggests both form and function. Form is attractive but can be expensive. Function can offer both lower cost and better design. Um, before uh, welcoming, welcoming you, I would uh, like to say that uh, Julian, uh, the last year he's uh, collaborating a lot with architectural uh, offices and practices, so I think that this uh, we should take it as an opportunity in order to um, get the maximum out of him in relation with uh, our architectural project. So help me welcome Julian. Well, thank you very much for that very warm welcome. Uh, and I know I always get a warm welcome when I come here, which is why I come. Anyway, um, tonight, you've probably seen the title, and um, I thought, well, maybe I should have a title which, on the one hand, was challenging, because that prepares you for the fact that I'm nearly always challenging. Uh, but don't worry, it's never personal, it's always about ideas. Um, but another one it gave me a chance to do the local colour, which I think everybody does, and that is say something about the Sagrada Familia, uh, which I first saw um, with a cousin of mine when we visited here in 1963. Uh, there was an argument about the place with the local council. They were thinking of pulling it down. We climbed up to the top of one of the towers and found that it was being used as a urinal. Uh, and so that was the state of the Sagrada Familia about, what, that's um, 50 years ago now. Hell. Um, so, anyway, there will be a bit of that in here as well. So, nature dictates, do architects listen? Well, here is the guy, um, Otto Schmidt, who invented the word biomimetics, which is um, a word which I use to describe what I do these days. Uh, and it's basically trying to bridge the gap between biology and technology. Otto Schmidt was a physicist and his elder brother was a biologist, he taught biology, and so Otto would help his elder brother to put together models for the students illustrating nervous function. And he realized that he, although he was using physics to describe a biological system, that, that it was also possible to do it the other way and to use ideas from biology to inform physical systems, or systems of physics, systems of engineering. Um, and so in the uh, mid-1950s, I think, he started formulating some of these ideas. And there are one or two very good websites which go through this story and talk also about some of his other inventions. He was quite a polymath. He, um, he, he, although many people haven't heard of him, if you're in electronics, you might have heard of the Schmidt trigger. 
which is something which he apparently invented while he was doing his thesis. So it's well worthwhile looking this guy up. What amuses me about this actually is that um, he's all very, he, he looks a reasonably relaxed there but his hand here doesn't look quite so relaxed uh, so um, maybe he was just waiting for everybody to go away I don't know um, I was going to say a little bit about other places in the world which do um, biomimetics as a moderate amount in the States there's a huge number of people in Germany very interested in it so I thought I'd put this up because not only have we got universities in here Saarland, um, where's Bremen, Tübingen, uh, Berlin but there are also one or two companies and also the Max Planck Society uh, and they have some very good exhibits which they've um, sort of almost corporate exhibits and this is one of the ones they have in the Hanover Messe and you've got pictures of aircraft and, and uh, fish uh, here you've got a hammerhead shark here you've got a model of shark skin uh, which increases the or rather decreases friction and you've got some ideas for bird-like gliders so uh, there's quite a lot going on in Germany and if you want to find out about that you dial in bionic <coughs> into your Google Finder. Now, by contrast, in the UK, we have, I say in the UK, it's, although it's called Swedish Biomimetics, we have a company which is probably the only one in the world which is concentrating on this biology engineering interface, uh, but it's a virtual company virtual venter and intersectional, which I would regard as um, interdisciplinary and the concept is that you have individuals, you have laboratories, you have universities which are more or less masterminded here but they also, the Swedish Biomimetics has got some money and it will invest in good projects and there's one project for instance which it's invested well over half a million in which is the, uh, a beetle called the Bombardier Beetle which can push out of its back end uh, in a very very um, a targeted manner uh, liquid at about 110 degrees centigrade uh, and this is highly corrosive and it uses it to frighten off um, an attacker. And the beetle is very small, it's only about half a centimetre long. This has been developed by um, a prof professor in the University of Leeds and it's being trialled at the moment as a fuel injector in um, Lotus cars so it's possible to take an idea and move it totally out of its original context which in this instance is some way of repelling um, an attacker in a biological context using the same set of tricks in other words producing a very fine stream of particles to in another context which in this instance is um, a, uh, a fuel injector now uh, Swedish biomimetics is all, all around the place as you can see it's mostly in the UK but we also have Norway, um, Biocon International you've just seen a little bit about that uh, the guy who started it off Lars Uno Larsson has an office here in, uh, in Stockholm and we're also setting up places in <coughs> Australia and um, in San Francisco and now in Japan so it's becoming worldwide now I'll give you just a bit of a, so, so that's the commercial side of it shall we say so this is a practical uh, area and talking to architects there are a few who are being practical as well and coming up with concepts from biology which they can put successfully into architecture but some of the time I'm afraid the architects don't listen and some of the time because they don't have a biologist working with them they get the wrong story and so I'm going to be talking about some of those. Well, let's start off with some successful stories. This is the biomimetic product, Velcro. NASA claims that it invented it, or it has claimed that it invented it. Actually, NASA was the first breakthrough because they used Velcro to seal uh, various bits of one of their early spacesuits. It was designed, or invented rather, by a guy called George de Mestrel, who was a Swiss inventor and he took his dog for a walk one Sunday 
through the woods and came, when he came back it had got hooks from this plant here, this is the seed head and so that each of these hooks goes back to a single seed uh, and those hooks then engage on the fur of an animal which is walking past and as he was taking off the hooks uh, from the dog he started to think about this as a semi-permanent type of joining mechanism now what always struck me was that how many times had he done that before? why did he suddenly think uh, this could be a very good semi-permanent joining mechanism and the answer came in a book I was reading uh, on design about zips it appears that about a week or two before he'd been having trouble with his wife's zip so you never, I never ask any further circumstances uh, but so you, you never know where an idea is going to come from you never know what is going to trigger uh, some sort of invention even so having made this invention it still took him five or six years to find a company which A thought it was worthwhile doing and B how to form these hooks because these foot hooks have to be made out, they're made out of nylon but they have to be hardened so that um, well you can see they're cut there after production uh, but they have to be hardened so that they retain some sort of stiffness but you find them in different types on many plants here's a common English plant um, grows <coughs> by the side of the road and it has tiny hooks on it uh, and this can climb up hedgerows now, it can climb up other plants just using these tiny hooks um, and here we have a New Zealand plant called Piri Piri which is very very difficult to get off if Mr. Mestral had had this plant on his dog uh, he would probably have given up all hope of getting his dog clean and just cut the fur off so you have a wide range within biology of even a single mechanism another uh, example which you may have come across is um, this lotus effect which actually is found on a large number of plants the concept is that the lotus plant here which is a symbol of eastern purity grows in stagnant water and so as it comes out of this dark stagnant water with rubbish probably all over it when it rains all the rubbish is cleaned off both the leaf and the flower and the whole thing appears absolutely pure so how does it do it? well this was worked out by um, a guy called Christoph Neinhaus basically who is currently professor of botany in Dresden University but he was doing a PhD in Bonn at the time uh, and he discovered that the leaves of the lotus could have all sorts of rubbish on them here we have some dust but just a sprinkling of water would clean all that away this is how it works the water sits on the surface and when you see a rounded blob of water like that you know that the surface is hydrophobic the surface is resisting the water and this is how it does it these bubbles here are about five to eight microns apart so probably each one of these is produced by um, or sorry several of these are produced by a single cell but it's a hierarchical structure in, it, in that it's covered with wax small wax crystals and so you can see that giving the texture so anything which sits on the surface makes only very limited contact with the surface and is easily removed and these are some of the things that you can put on the surface which don't stick we have a glue here which is water based so that doesn't stick um, this is Christoph's honey spoon, he's very keen on honey and so he's had a special plastic spoon made uh, which has got that sort of surface texture on it you can't see it but the honey just comes straight off the spoon and this is one of the applications uh, for which should interest um, architects and that is a self-cleaning facade now I haven't heard very, of very many buildings which actually have this sort of finish on them and there is some noise going around that uh, you get a bacterial growth in the interstices of those little lumps um, but uh, I don't know, maybe you'd be able to tell me about that later on even so, this general concept um, when you can find it on the internet uh, has fed into a large number of different areas one of them is breathable waterproof clothing uh, and so the, um, 
where our ITV Denkendorf, uh, which is fairly close to Stutt Stuttgart, um, has made a large number of different textiles using these ideas. And you can also find them in roof tiles um, and, and various coatings. So it's quite a successful concept. Okay, so that is biomimetics actually from the commercial point of view. I now want to go into biomimetics from the ideas point of view. And this is the image which has been used, I gather, on some posters. And I deliberately chose it or created it because I thought, well, this is going to be a bit of a challenge. What we've got here, very obviously, in the background is um, an, an element from the Sagrada Familia. And what I've superimposed upon it is the true outline of a branching tree. Uh, and in fact, you find tree structures very commonly in, um, in buildings, as you know, most commonly, I think, in airport lounges. So I put together a collection of pictures of airport lounges showing you some of these tree structures. And in all of them there is a common fault. And I'll, put it, I'll talk about it now because it's the one that Gaudi has in that picture I've just shown you. And that is that this angle here, and also if you could see it, this angle here is always very sharp. So that's Shanghai. This is Stansted Airport. Um, and again, you've got quite a sharp re-entrant there. They get over it a bit by having a pin joint here. So they're taking out some of the bending forces. But I have seen some of these pin joints actually welded up, which doesn't really do much use. Uh, then Stuttgart Airport, which I think was probably one of the first airports to have this type of structure in it, uh, presumably under the influence of Fry Otto. Um, who, uh, as you know, worked in, the, um, in Stuttgart University. So here we have quite a nice tree structure, but once again we have relatively sharp re-entrance at these points, and all the tubes which come off are of constant diameter, um, and this presumably is um, a, a minimum radius curvature. Uh, Bangalore Airport, I was there about five years ago, and it was really just the shed in the middle of a field. So it's remarkable how these places transform themselves. And again, we have some sort of a tree structure. Well, uh, the latest one I could find is not um, an airport. It's a university in um, a place near Budapest. Uh, and I'd not heard of this architect before. But he'd produced some very nice tree structures here. And they are an advance on the ones that you see in these airports in that the branches so-called are somewhat tapered but also if you examine the insertion there and, and here as well for instance you can see that they're not circular they do actually have some depth on them which means they're going to have some bending resistance well what's this all mean in terms of um, biology how does it relate to the biology oh wait a moment yes this is Gaudi's uh, bug stroke feature. You know that if you have a Microsoft program and something goes wrong and you phone them up and you say it won't do so and so and uh, you say it's a bug and they say no it's a feature. Uh, and so I think this is Gaudi's secret bug stroke feature and that is that with all these columns here in the nave you have quite a, um, a, a, an important branching here and in some of these it can be quite complex at this point and I think that when he did this, which was what, about 1890, 1900, that sort of period, understanding of fracture mechanics was really very poor because this whole argument is going to move into fracture mechanics and the even distribution of stress around joints. And I think what may have happened here was that he couldn't solve the problem of having these things coming in at an angle and having the possibility of a stress concentration in this area, which uh, he wouldn't necessarily have known about. So he put a large lump of material around it to strengthen it. Uh, and so that's my story and we could argue about that if you wanted. He has, uh, though, obviously turned it into a feature. I, I suppose these, these photos were taken about three years ago. I suppose these wires which are hanging out now have got lamps on them or something like that, because that's what these holes look as if they're supposed to receive. So anyway, I think that feature started off as a cure for a bug. So let's have a look what the real cure ought to be. And I'm here using a lot of the work of a guy called Klaus Martek. 
who is a German engineer who did his habilitation uh, in um, the uh, nuclear power station in Karlsruhe and he did it mostly on fracture mechanics. To start off with he was doing s simply engineering fracture mechanics but he started to get interested in trees and found that trees have got some quite remarkable and uh, very convenient design aspects to them and he's developed some of these ideas even further. Um, I got to know him fairly well and we once spent uh, quite an amusing day wandering around the Black Forest hitting trees with a, with a rubber hammer and listening to the noise they made and from that you could diagnose which parts of the tree were rotten and so you could look up into the top of the tree and you'd see a dead branch, yes, well I can hear it coming down the trunk and you look at the root and you see that the roots have died away as well so even with a hammer you can start to diagnose some of the problems with plants. Anyway this is um, a set of diagrams which he's included in a number of his books uh, and he's comparing the red line here which is, well he calls it non-optimized this is the line which you would draw if, and, it, and it's shown here to rather larger um, scale this is the line that you would draw if you made, if you designed a tree using a standard design book and the design book would say that at a branching point the radius of curvature here has got to be no less than five centimeters or something like that for the particular loads. Well Klaus noticed that when you look at a real tree it's not like that. In fact the radius of curvature down there is very much smaller but the curvature is more complex and when I was drawing that curve superimposed on the bit of Gaudi's um, structure uh, I've found that it conforms very nicely to a Bezier curve with um, a single uh, point up at the top here and another point at the bottom where the um, axes are moving crossways. So it is a relatively simple curve in terms of generating it from a mathematical point of view. But Klaus, uh, this was the early days of finite element analysis and he called this the soft kill option because he was removing a certain amount of material and seeing what happened. This is the non-optimized system and you can just see there are some little red areas there which indicate high stresses. Here he's got a plot going across that area and you can see that there are high stresses on each side and correspondingly low stresses in the middle. So the optimized shape has a very different sort of curve. Klaus put this sort of design into some mechanical components made out of metal and found that whereas this type of curve maybe in a fatigue let test would last for a thousand uh, repetitions, uh, this type of curve could go on for several million. So it really does make a very great difference having the stress distributed evenly across the joint there. So he started looking at some other ideas which as far as I know haven't really been applied in architectural systems because um, the tree is trying to produce a structure, in this instance a column, which can respond to changes around it and maybe not be totally vertical, uh, but it's trying to produce leaves at as, high a, as great a height as possible because that's going to be the best way that it can be sure it gets sunlight. Uh, and using the least amount of wood in the stem as possible. And there are going to be times when the tree is leaning. And these are two ways in which the tree can combat that. In a softwood tree, a conifer, it puts in, um, the, sorry this one up here, a softwood tree, it puts in material on the compressive side and actually pushes the tree up to be vertical. But in a hardwood tree, a broadleaf tree, which tends to shed its leaves in winter, uh, it puts a tensile component on this side and actually winches the tree upright. Now, uh, this then is very similar to a pre-stressed concrete system. Uh, uh, but my suspicion is that we could probably learn quite a lot from looking at the way the tree managed to do this pre-stressing and a similar sort of thing happens when you consider uh, either a branch or a root it, tend it tends to increase its second moment of area this is actually moving towards being an I-beam um, or else you can, in, you, it, you can produce this sort of section uh, and this is what you signally do not see when you have a tree system built in um, 
in some sort of a, an airport, for instance. And he takes this further into um, having a building, shall we say, with several floors. Uh, and this is what it looks like when you start putting tree structures in there. Now, I've no idea whether this would work. It looks to me as if there's not enough structural support here, but this is what his son said. The crinkly outline, by the way, is due to, um, I suspect, the uh, rather lacking uh, fineness of his, um, of his finite element models. And this is the sort of design that he ends up with. And I honestly don't know the advantage, you could tell me, what the advantages are of this type of design. But remember, this has been designed by an engineer, um, and so presumably he's used finite elements to do this. Um, how, uh, uh, can I ask a question? Um, I assume we have some architects here. How many of you actually use finite element analysis in your design? Anybody? Have you heard of finite element analysis? Or are you just shy? So you, you don't actually use finite element analysis? You don't divide, well maybe I'd better backtrack a bit and say that finite element analysis is um, a process whereby you divide up the uh, object that you're looking at into lots of very small units, uh, each of which you then assume has got linear properties. And each of those small units you can give up to 50, um, shall we say, um, attributes to, including stiffness and isotropy and stuff like that. Uh, and then you decide what loads you want on it. So um, that's what uh, Klaus was doing here. Uh, he's got um, three plates here and he knows what loads he wants on them. And basically he can just take a square like this, put those loads in position and by rem uh, having this whole area divided up into lots of small pieces, he can work out, or the computer can work out for him, what lines the force might move in. He can then retain material around those lines, so the lines of force turn into, um, into structure, and he can remove material from the spaces in between, hence his soft kill option. And this actually is very, very similar to the sort of approach that Gaudí was using. You go into the basement of the Sagrada, um, familiar, and you find some of his drawings there where he's just taking a roof and then plotting in the lines where he thinks the support should occur. So this is a mathematical version, if you like, of his experimental approach. But being mathematical, it's possible to come up with much more complex shapes and also be much more confident about them. Um, Klaus has developed these ideas further and this is an interesting story in that it's um, a car which was designed by Daimler Chrysler about five or six years ago uh, around a fish called the boxfish. This is a fish which lives in, uh, on coral reefs and it looks like a box. But somehow or other it's got a very, very low drag coefficient. And so Daimler Chrysler were very interested in this because they said if we can make a car which has got as low drag coefficient as this fish, then maybe it'll use less, less petrol to um, accelerate, etc. But it was also the, su the um, subject of a design study for the front left door pillar and engine mounting. You can't really see this on. This is a relatively small model obviously produced by a rapid prototyping machine. Uh, but a few years ago I led um, a group of people around um, the Netherlands and Germany and one or two other European countries specifically visiting places where biomimetics had been used uh, to design um, various products. And this was one of the um, design um, exercises which would be done by Daimler Chrysler and the person who did it was one of Klaus Martek's early students. So he applied these very same design concepts to this front end of the car. Bit by bit he removed material, he changed also the angles at which the various struts were, uh, were working and improved the joints between the struts and he reduced the weight of, of admittedly only this small area but presumably it could go over the rest of the car he reduced the weight by 40 percent 
Now that's very significant, both in terms of the weight uh, that you then have to accelerate, but also in these days where steel is becoming more expensive, metal in general is becoming more expensive, because most of it's going to China, that it also would reduce the amount of raw material that you put into it. And the idea was not taken up because Daimler Chrysler said it's too expensive to fabricate. Now, some work which I did quite a few years ago now on hedgehogs. Um, I f the hedgehog is a little animal which you find snuffling around the base of hedges. Uh, and it's covered in spines. And you may think that those spines are there to uh, protect it from your pet dog or something like that. They're not. They originally involved, we think, as shock absorbers so that a, a hedgehog can climb up the side of a building and when it wants to get down it just rolls itself up into a ball and drops to the ground and actually bounces. But the interest we had was looking at those spines and working out how they could be shock absorbers uh, and looking then at the distribution of material within the spine. And the way the hedgehog had done it was a uh, very, very careful and clever design where an engineer would use, probably have just put in a little bit more material. And so we could generate a general concept which I think works over most of biology. And that is that in engineering, material is cheap and design is expensive. Whereas in biology, material is expensive and design is cheap. So. Um, in the previous two lectures here I've been talking about some general rules which you might be able to use to do biomimetics without really knowing any biology. And this seems to be one of the general rules that biology uses. It's worthwhile taking more time over designing a component because you'll, you'll use less material and you'll also produce a more durable component. So that's what had happened with this front part of the boxfish car, but unfortunately, although it was beautiful design, it wasn't taken up on. However, when it comes to furniture, maybe you can afford to spend a little bit more time at it. Here we have a table which has been produced or designed by the same sort of mechanism, and you can see Klaus Matek here is, um, is acknowledged and here we have once again this same system of removing extra bits of material and you can see these curves are really quite complex. So he's designing quite a bit of furniture um, and here is a, a chair which designed using the same sort of system. Now I've got this weird Australian here, uh, his name is Peter Cook, uh, so Pook Tree Chair is presumably Peter Cook's tree chair and he's grown this chair but it strikes me that although it works it maybe took him a year or two actually to grow it and when you move into your new flat you don't have to wait two years for the furniture to arrive uh, and I also think he's missed out a trick because he is now sat in a chair which is obviously deflecting quite a bit and the outlines of all these bits of, of timber are pretty much the same diameter and what I'd like to see, an um, um, interesting experiment perhaps, is to grow this thing upside down. And again to take the, um, the, the cue from Gaudi and hang weights on this piece of wood, these bits of wood as they grow, hang weights in various positions which would simulate the weight of a person sitting on the seat so that the chair then becomes, uh, is growing in response to the sitter. Uh, this would be one of, the, um, one, one, one of the main aims, maybe, of people who are designing biomimetic structures, and that is to make a structure which actually grows within the environment within which it's going to be used. We can do that with computers to a certain extent, but not so much um, with the real thing. And I finish this part of, of trees, of static trees at any rate, with a picture taken from a design study which I've been involved with. I can't say too much about it um, because at the moment it's still a design study um, and it has to go on to the next stage. But um, as a result of some of the things that I've said to the architects that I was working with, they've put in some tree structures as part of the su support of this roof area here. And lo and behold, the joints between the various bits are very much more carefully designed. 
and these I think although these are very very slender and I admit they're slender partly because that's what architects like to draw um, but I think that these are quite reasonable uh, for taking the load because this is where the high stresses are going to occur and this is where failure is going to occur well this is about trees growing up there are trees which grow down uh, and um, I've got one here this was in the main courtyard of a, of a Buddhist monastery in Taiwan a few years ago I was visiting with um, this um, engineer here and one of his students so his student is about just only slightly shorter than me and here they are stood under the arch of a banyan tree or a fig tree and obviously there was a building here at some time and the tree has grown around it but what you see here is not a trunk you see an assemblage of roots and this is a very interesting design solution uh, partly to how to grow tall without needing to grow tall the um, banyan tree starts right up at the top of another tree and bit by bit drops roots down which strangle the tree that it's growing around until eventually you just have the remnants of the tree itself but the way in which those roots are constructed is very interesting and as far as I know it, there's, there's a huge opening here for some experimental work in self-designing structures and you could also get yourself quite a nice bit of time at Alicante because along the foreshore there they've got quite a number of these trees growing this is um, a banyan tree growing in the garden in, um, in Brisbane in Australia and you can see that you've got branches growing out from the side and as they grow out from the side they drop these roots. And these roots start off as really quite flimsy structures, maybe only about five millimeters across. They get down to the ground and they insert themselves into the ground. And they don't just insert themselves into the ground, they in fact transform themselves from being just bits of string basically hanging down. And it grows and it becomes a strut and the tree then grows out further. So this is a beautiful self-designing structure. In fact, a single tree like this can grow to cover a very large area. There's apparently one outside Delhi, which is something like half a mile across. One tree, half a mile across, and it grows in this sort of fashion. So you see a photograph of that, and it's a bit like being in a three-dimensional cage with all the vertical bars. Here's another view of the same tree and so you can see that there's quite a few of these which have grown really to a high, um, a high degree of, of support and what you then see is that this is still quite large but because the support has been taken away the need for support has been taken away from this component it hasn't really grown very much in diameter so the tree is all the time responding to the loads which are laid upon it well the ideal of course wouldn't be to grow something like this it would be to grow a bridge shall we say and a bridge which changes its stiffness and its ability to support structure to support loads as you go across it uh, and in fact the banyan tree has been used for just this purpose uh, and here I've got some photographs here um, of a, banyan, a tree made out of banyan roots and obviously this has been trained to go across in some way but it's a beautiful um, tension structure and of course this whole bridge is pre-tensioned and as loads go across it um, here are some steps leading into it as loads are taken across it it will respond to those loads so here we have a self-designing bridge um, I don't know how you would do this in, um, in, in our technology but there it is actually working now um, I suspect you've all heard about the Eastgate Centre in Harare and how that's designed on the basis of what we thought we knew of a termite mound and in fact it was based on a misconception of the way a termite mound works so I'm going to talk you through the misconception but also then I hope present you with some concepts which might lead to um, even more versatile buildings than this one 
Um, the cooling in this, by the way, is affected by fans and using the thermal capacity of the building, of the structure of the building, to store heat during the day and the fans are really turned on at, the night, at night and so the whole building is cooled down at night and regains its thermal capacity. But here we have a termites, a termites nest. There aren't very many that big and this is probably 100, 200 years old. Um, and mostly um, you find the nests underground. Here are the, the animals which produce those nests. Some of them are winged and so they're going to fly away and make another nest but most of them are not winged at all. And this is, these are some soldier termites. These are so-called nasuti termites which can spray nasty fluids out from the front end. And then these are some of the nymphs which do most of the work around the place. They're the slaves of the colony. And right in the middle of the colony you have a queen, so-called, or you might have more than one queen, and, and she's an egg machine. She's pumping out eggs here at a rate of about a hundred a minute. Um, so she's being fed at this end and the eggs come out at that end and they're then distributed through the nest. And the food which they feed on it comes from uh, rotting vegetable matter on which there's growing a special fungus, uh, quite a specific fungus which people have tried to, to uh, breed in the lab but they can't quite get the right conditions, the right temperature, the right humidity and probably also you'll find that the dung of these animals is quite an important part of the mix. So what do the t nests look like? A very large proportion of them are actually underground and it's only in areas where it's liable to flooding that you're going to find very much of the nest above the ground. Um, here's an example of an above ground nest and this height here may be no more than a metre or two. And the concept which was put forward in almost the entire absence of evidence other than simply the shape of the thing was that in some of the nests which have got a sealed cap to them it's the heat of the fungus garden down here that runs at a somewhat higher temperature which is causing the air here to rise, it reduces in density so it rises through the centre of the nest, reaches the top, flows down some channels around the outside and in doing so gets cooler and you have gas exchange here so you get rid of the CO2 that the termites and the fungus have been producing and you uh, reoxygenate the air and that then circulates down below. So you've got here a circulation system or here you can have a complete loss system where you're using the stack effect up at the top um, in order to make use of the gradient in wind velocity here. And so the idea there is that you're pulling air in from here and it's going out at the top. Uh, and termites are also supposed to be able to keep these nests at a very constant temperature and they don't. Um, you fi find a number of places in the literature it says termite keeps its, its nest at 87 degrees Fahrenheit. Well that is again utter rubbish. This whole topic area is one where you'll find that stories are repeated without really any examination of what the truth is. And so this is the fluctuating temperature over a period of about a year uh, and basically it's doing, you can see the termite nest temperature is fluctuating much more than the ground temperature but the termite's nest is doing the same thermal mass trick that the Eastgate Centre is doing. So how is the termite's nest working? Well we have an, an analogue ourselves, each of us. It turns out, and this is work done, um, I'll read their names out, uh, by uh, Scott Turner who is from the Environmental Science and Forestry Department in Syracuse and a guy called Rupert Saw who's an engineer from the University of Loughborough. And they said this system cannot work, possibly work as a through flow system. They dissected it, they looked at the dimensions and distribution of all the internal air channels and they said actually this is a lung. And if you concentrate on when you breathe in and out you find that the amount of air that you actually move is relatively small and so you might move air uh, over this sort of distance but you never actually ventilate the entire lung. If you breathe in very deeply you may take air down this far but the rest of the movement of oxygen 
and um, CO2 out within the lung is more to do with diffusion convection and diffusion when you get right to the very end here. So diffusion um, set up by uh, a, a, um, a gradient because down here oxygen is being taken out and put into the bloodstream so there's a continuous gradient here of oxygen concentration so it's moving down that gradient and the actual ventilation you do is relatively small so it turns out that the termites nest works in the same sort of way that you can have wind coming past the nest at this point and so this is a bit like the initial oxygenation as you breathe in a relatively small amount there is an area somewhere in the middle where the um, where these mechanism changes over to a diffusion mechanism and then when you get down to the bottom of the nest it's nearly all diffusion this is to some extent amplified by the fact that this nest here is working at a higher temperature and so there's a tendency maybe for air to go up here and then that's going to cause air to come down in this direction here but what is very important is not just the fact that the wall of the nest is porous and it's made deliberately so but that these spaces here have got different resonant frequencies and so one of the ways of oxygenating um, your, your lungs is to do uh, very shallow breathing uh, and this is um, a trick that dogs use when they pant because they want to evaporate water but they don't want to hyperventilate so they're moving air very quickly past the, past the mouth, past the mucosa uh, but they're not really deeply ventilating so the rest of the lung is still working on a relatively low oxygen supply they're not producing, getting too much oxygen into the bloodstream um, and so that's possibly what's going on here and the termites in order to control water for instance which is one of the main ways in which they can control temperature evaporation of water exactly the same way that we do is to take um, particles of the nest containing water and distribute them around these air passages here so the termites nest is not static it's filled with termites and those termites are controlling what's going on in the nest all the time uh, the other thing of course is that the termite is the equivalent of the red blood cell uh, but what nobody has mentioned is that insects are capable of withstanding a very high concentration of CO2 in, in their hemolymph, in their blood without actually falling over so maybe we can have 1% at the, at the very outside a, ter a termite or any insect can go up to about 30% CO2 so it's actually not particularly crucial from the termites point of view that this part of the nest gets good oxygenation however what this does is to put forward new ideas as to how you might ventilate a building or even control the, the temperature by having the wall of the building panting uh, and what's the wall of a building? it's a division why, does it, why can't it have holes in it? We put, we put up a wall and then we put holes in it with windows um, if we go back to some of the vernacular types of building we find that quite often the wall is made of plant material which is going to be naturally porous and so that then allows the building itself to breathe so we seem to have moved into some sort of solid uh, structure for the walls and yet we could introduce complexity like this and from a simple design point of view once you start producing morphological complexity then you can introduce all sorts of, um, of uh, other functional complexity so I'm now going to zoom right to the other end of animal size um, and, uh, rather than the nest of the termite which is, can be several meters high to this little animal Oikopleura if you know your Greek you'll know that this means many houses plura, plural, oiko, oikos, um, living so this means an animal which produces many houses and it's a tiny little worm about five millimeters long which lives in the sea and it produces about five or six of these houses every day and it produces it as a secretion from its body surface so here we have an animal which lives in a house which it produces simply by uh, using its body surface as a template it has 
differing materials in different parts of its body and some recent work is starting to show that you have different proteins produced in different areas and these then interact with the seawater and they swell and produce this house which and, and here we have the animal itself so it's in there wiggling its tail pulling in um, liquid pulling in seawater across this filter and then out through this exhalant hole. Having a look at it in a bit more detail um, it takes about 10 minutes to make one of these and here we have the inlet filter the animal is inside there, deeply inside there with its tail threshing around and you can see the huge complexity of this structure. Even more remarkably this is the net which goes over the inhalant aperture and you can see here the scale one micrometer so these lines here are simply one molecule thick and the latest research shows that they're actually made of cellulose fibers this group of animals related to the sea squirts are some of the few uh, which produce cellulose cellulose is normally t considered typical of plants here we have some which produce here we have some animals which are producing cellulose fibers and they produce them from these little rosettes of enzyme and those, end, those rosettes are held in place by rather stiff tubular elements which you find inside the cell. So Oikopleura makes its own house. Um, I'm going to finish with a story uh, which is one of these ones about sustainability because although we probably use about I don't know 40 percent of our total energy in terms of heating and lighting buildings uh, there's also quite a drive to be sustainable uh, for the people who actually live in the building and this is um, a, a history of a project which was done in the UK about four or five years ago uh, no, the ABLE project but colloquially known as the Cardboard to Caviar project and this is the guy who ran it, Graham Wiles and it was to a large extent um, to enable people from of rather low intellectual ability uh, and maybe some of them with a criminal record to do something which was useful and form a part of a community so there was some therapy involved here as well as producing a um, producing a, a nice system so he started off with local food company uh, restaurant producing large amounts of cardboard packaging and so he would chop the cardboard packaging up and sell it to people keeping horses as bedding uh, and then when this when he got it back from the horses the bedding had not only been chewed up a bit but it was nicely mixed up with horse dung um, you'll find dung um, is a, a repeated it's almost a light motif of this part of the talk dung uh, what's brown and sounds like a bell dung um, anyway here we have some worms feeding on it and his original idea was to uh, sell the worms to people uh, who are fishing but unfortunately the fish bait people actually didn't take the bait and they said well no we don't want it actually so he thought well I'm going to have to do something with it myself so he started a fish farm and this was this uh, Latin name Acupensa the sturgeon very high value fish uh, so he started growing sturgeon on it and he could sell these back to the restaurant very good business here we have a loop but he wasn't satisfied with that because from the restaurant what do we get? Dung! Here we are and from dung of course you can grow things and so he started growing willow as biomass and taking this into um, a, an energy unit here so here we have willow coppice from the sewage works fertilizer willow coppice heat to heat the water to his fish farm so the fish would grow more quickly uh, oh, what have we got here? Um, we've got growing tomatoes, so he can now actually on the uh, around the fish farm in a bit of extra land that he bought, he can grow food for the people who work there. And we have another loop back to dung. Um, and then where do we go? Ah, yes. Um, in order to grow more fish, you do of course have to have fish eggs with the with acupensa 
it produces caviar and some of that goes back to the shops and restaurants, very high value, but some of it he needs to produce juvenile fish. And, oh, what have we got here? What do you think? Thank you. <laughs> um, and so here we have growing watercress and he also had an orchard. Um, and so starting from shops, this restaurant, and just going through this cardboard system, he produced a really rather nice network of, uh, and it's a closed loop network, that's the important thing. Well, this part of it at any rate. So this is a model, a small model of the world. And I can go back to that um, office project that I've been involved with, and this is the sort of thing that we have on the top of that office. Um, and one of the problems there was that the uh, people who were involved with it, the architects, said, well, we can take all the food that the people are eating and compost that. And I said, no, you don't want to do that. In an ecological system, you want to get the energy out at, in small stages so that then you can have um, a, quite a complex ecology uh, on the, sitting on the top of the building. So this is our initial model, and what I hope is that we'll be able to produce extra steps within it. This sort of thing works very nicely and there's a restaurant opened up in Amsterdam called De Kass and so I, I haven't inquired to them about their bell but um, they grow very nice food there and it's always fresh and you can always see it. And there I'll stop. Thank you very much for listening. Is that on? Yeah. You pass that around the audience. Yes. Any questions or comments? Should we have the lights up so as we can actually see somebody put their hands up, do you think? No? Thank you. No lights. Well, you'll just all have to grow with in glow with intelligence, won't you? Um, no questions? Or, ah, oh, a brave man. <laughs> uh, is there any research right now going on uh, on how trees pump water? with this vacuum system? Oh, this is, a, this is a perennial problem. Yes, they're well, losing water. This is how do trees actually draw water up, um, up the trunk. And there is supposed to be um, a maximum height of, what is it, 30 meters, I think, um, beyond which the uh, column of water will break. Um, because if you, if you stop the water from nucleating as the, uh, temperature, as the pressure goes up and therefore the boiling temperature goes down, you'll, you'll come to a point where even at normal temperatures the, the, you'll have nucleation occurring and you then get some sort of an embolism within the water column. Uh, people have actually looked at sunflowers and found that in, in those plants, which are not particularly tall, the water columns can fill and empty. And so having an embolism there doesn't necessarily mean that that part of the water conducting system is out of commission. Uh, so that means that that particular idea as to how it is you can pull water up doesn't work. Certainly the roots are pumping water in from the bottom. So my answer to that is no. I keep seeing people producing answers to that question and I haven't seen a good one yet. So why, why, was, why, why were you thinking of it? It would be a way to take tap water up to the top of the building without actually needing a pump or something. Yeah, well, can't do it. Don't know how it's done. Sorry, that's one, re one way we can't use trees yet. Mm. Yes! Um, in, uh, in 2009, there was this research being done about... Well, could, could you just wait for the microphone? Because the uh, people in the back will, will find it difficult to hear otherwise. Hello? Um. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. In, in 2009, there was this research being done about mixing um, 
uh, live organisms with limestone to grow to rebuild oh, yeah. the foundation. So this is the stuff going on at the University of Delft. Yeah. Um, mm. How do you like? I don't know much about there. Like, there's nothing more public about where that I've research not, is not, going. I've not heard anything further about it. No. Um, I, I went to a design um, uh, fair there, uh, which they were given a prize because it was a student project, I think, to start off with, and they were given a prize with uh, several hundred euros, or it might have been thousand. I don't know. Um, to start off their own company and everybody was very interested in it but I'm afraid although I am in touch with people at the University of Delft every so often I haven't heard anything more about that particular project um, so I'm sorry I can't help you. No that's fine but do you see like this sort of system being used like not only just like with limestone but with other natural elements like how I guess how easy is this sort of connection between uh, taking something like rock and having it grow like a living organism? Like how does that...? Well, the, the big problem with all these things is, is energy. Where do you get the energy from? Uh, and at lunchtime we were talking about one of these projects where it was in Indonesia, where um, they're putting uh, metal frames into the sea and then put a very low potential on it and that actually can encourage organisms to settle on it. Um, but you're still using the metabolism of the organisms in order to, um, to, to, to get calcium basically taken out of the seawater and deposited on these bits of metal. And it takes a very long time because, um, as I was showing in a lecture earlier today, in biology, energy is one of the lowest of, um, or the least used ways of solving a problem. And so there the commonly isn't very much energy available within a biological system. So it's, it's very slow. Uh, but I've just been reading a paper actually, um, which is produced by some people in Ireland, looking at the mechanical properties of the cuticle of an insect. And this might not sound very promising, but they've been measuring not just its stiffness, but also its durability. And the cuticle of an insect is a simple, relatively simple, um, composite material, fibrous composite. So you've got very, very fine fibres which are only a few nanometers in diameter, uh, uh, embedded in a matrix of, um, of a protein. Uh, and the protein itself can crystallise under some circumstances. But the toughness of that material, the durability, is every bit as good as the sort of durability that you'd expect of a material made of a ceramic. So it may be that it's not, well coming back to one of my previous statements, it's not the material that you use, it's the way you put the bits together. So in other words, structure is the most important uh, aspect. And what we should be thinking about, uh, and again you see this in biology, is the way in which we put materials together, and uh, right down maybe even at the molecular level. And that way, by controlling things, we can get very, very much more efficient materials. If we get more efficient materials, we need less of it to, to do a, produce a particular job. It's also going to be lighter weight, and so that means we have less material needed to support it, etc., etc. Uh, and the best model for something like that at the moment is the Eiffel Tower. 20 years design lifetime, and it's stood up for about 130 now so that's uh, that's not over designed um, it's just doing rather more than the makers thought it would thank you somebody in the back twitched slightly but he may just have been scratching himself uh. I can warm up a bit <laughs> there um, can I ask a question? If these guys are obviously doing such important projects that they don't want to give anybody any clues whatsoever as they to what they might they be. They need a bit of warming up, I think. <laughs> All right. How do you do that? Do we do a song and dance I, act? I, I, I would like to, to say something. I don't know if it's okay. a question or, or a metaphor yeah. or a comment or a doubt. Um, but I was, uh, my mind was stuck a bit with the, um, uh, with the project of the termites. Um, Mainly, uh, mainly because I knew this project of Rupert Shore, but I knew it in 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 its uh, in in only one phase of the coin, no. Mm. So the phase that was more related with digital fabrication, the phase that he was doing several experiments of how he could 3D scan uh, mm. the structure of of um, uh, what is the word, the term it's uh, house. I don't know. What's yeah, the, the mound. Exactly. 
uh, and then how you could represent it uh, digitally using computational design and then he had mm. like a great great experiment uh, and research done in that direction and I was impressed to see um, a different kind of analytical approach that as I understand it's not published and it's very much related with uh, the metabolism of the system, no? Mm. And um, I am thinking that it is, uh, on the one hand, this is interesting, and on the other hand, uh, it's, um, uh, it's a bit challenging because uh, it actually gives us a feedback of, of not only how a single organism functions, but how we can take a lesson of a system of a community of, of uh, animals, no? Or, or, or biosystems. Okay, you have so to be very, very careful here. Because you've got all these different types of termite. And... Uh, but the analyze is not so much in relation with the type of the termite. It's rather than how they work as a system, as a whole. Right. But each of those termites is very specialised in what it does. So you've got some soldier termites, and if they want to block the nest up, they just put their head in the hole and they sit there. And, um, and That's what uh, I'm going to, eh? That's yeah. what I'm going to. I uh, haven't finished yet. <laughs> okay, but um, if, if you put your head in a hole and just hold it there, and something else comes along and tries to um, destroy you, they just leave their head there. And you can have something coming in behind and biting the head off, and it leaves its head there. I mean, the, the whole point, or, or rather a large part of being in an insect colony, is it's the colony is more important than the individual, and so they can be destroyed. It's a bit like the ultimate um, free market economy. We can never have a free market economy, because we don't allow people to die when um, they cease to have enough money. So, um, it's very, very difficult to take an extreme model like that and apply it to um, one of our communities. One of the problems with termites is that uh, you can't get into the nest and you can't see what's going on in there. And, My and question would be not rather to take this into apply it in communities. Well, no, I was going to go a bit further than that and say that if you look at ants, termites are called white ants um, and they're relatively low down in the sort of uh, evolution of insects. But then you've got other ants uh, which are related to bees and wasps and things like that, which are some of the most successful organisms. And you can see to some extent how they function as groups uh, and so they form hunting groups but they change the organization of the group as the external uh, conditions change so if they're in exploratory mode they're allowed to be relatively free and they can keep whatever whatever things they find it sounds more like bankers than anything else actually um, but if they have a goal that they and they know where they're going to get the food then there's a much greater tendency for the organization to change itself into a linear fashion and for the food then to be passed all the way down uh, until it gets to the nest so there, by changing the way that you introduce awards rewards rather within society it may be possible to change the way in which people interact uh, and that then would start to give you a cohesive colony where people would be more likely to um, I don't know put themselves at risk but certainly to change their behavior in uh, accord with some sort of perceived reward yeah? Yeah, this was one part of my question which uh, okay. took it even further than I was thinking of. Okay. No, but I, on, the, on the one hand is this kind of adaptability that it, it, as, a as a consequence is the change of the attitude, no? Of the yeah. units, of the agents. Whether these agents are, are animals but, but or humans. Or so you can change their attitude by giving them different things and different amounts of different things. Yes. Mm. But what I wanted also to say, apart from this, that it is a very delicate issue and very dangerous, um, I, would, uh, I would also like to, I was thinking mainly uh, that it's interesting to take this example in order to start thinking, for example, um, independent elements, as for instance the wall, you know, how we can apply this kind of systems in walls or in buildings or in structures. Uh, but then uh, it would, might be very interesting to see how you can apply it in a series of structures apply or in a series of, um, of uh, uh, built environments, no? Yeah. And then it would maybe um, um, create this kind of, of uh, um, um, I don't know, flexible 
community situation that is related with structure, with built structure, but also with the people that they are in. How do you define flexibility? Uh, well, that's, a, that's a huge question. <laughs> um, uh, could you, could you speak into the microphone so uh, people in the back can hear? Flexibility, the capability of changing properties in relation with external or internal uh, inputs, for instance. Okay, but um, you can... Basically what you'd be experiencing is the people themselves changing their experience of what's going on around them. So the easiest way to do it would be get to, to get them to move to another part of the system. Where, and so you, have, um, you, you, you start off when you're newly married with a single room apartment and then maybe you moved into a double room and then, oh dear, the children come along and you move into one which has got three soundproofed bedrooms um, and then they leave and you start downsizing again but how many people are actually going to move like that? You've got to, there are t two major things I can see in the way. One is that you've got to give them some sort of inducement. And you see, it's the use of the environment that you're, you're, we're talking about here. You've got to give them an inducement. But people are finding out that there is an, an intrinsic uh, attitude within people not to want to sell something for um, less than maybe what they're perceived uh, value of the thing is, despite the fact that the market value may be less than what they perceive the real value to be. Uh, and so you've got to get over this energy hump, if you like, of it's mine and I don't want to do anything, I don't want to sell it for less than I think it's worth. Uh, so there's a number of problems, I think, associated with that. But I think basically what you, when you're talking about adaptiveness, you're talking about um, a system where you've got people and buildings. And I think it's much easier to keep the building static and get the people to move. But that's still a problem. So I don't, don't think you necessarily need to make the, the buildings quite so responsive as people think. Uh, but everybody has to sit on a roundabout, perhaps. Is that an idea? Don't know. Anything more? Come on, you've had, a, you've had, you've, you, you've had your warming warming bit. Yeah! Great! Right at the back there. Or were you just stretching? <laughs> well, it's very hard to say it uh, in English because it's very abstract. I hope I could uh, fully convey my thought to you. Um, in recent years, we have this bio-digital architecture, biology, that has been, it, it has been a very Sorry, could you hold the microphone a bit? Uh, okay, it uh, has been a very interesting topic that architects have, have found this kind of thing to kind of relate it with what they do in terms of forms. We are now having some softwares to generate these natural forms and in terms of urban, how these organisms that work in nature, how we could relate them in our world. The thing is, after so many eras in architecture, from the beginning till now, we are now at the point to do what the nature does at the beginning. How the nature works, like, I don't know, how many billion years ago. And after that, what will happen? Okay, so we reach at the point that, okay, we come with the sustainable buildings that they will not produce CO2 or something, but uh, is this what we really are here? You're, you're, you're heading towards the problem no, of the, the self. The thing is, yeah. do you think, as a biologist, that we can surpass that, I mean, surpass nature itself, the platform? Can we create, a, can we be like a god, <laughs> our own god, that we could change the platform? Well, first of all, can I point out a problem? And that is, if you have a building which can repair itself, you'll never be able to knock it down. Uh, and so recycling is going to be a problem immediately. But um, it depends how you measure success. Because uh, it, it, there's no doubt about it, we can make bigger things than nature can, we can make things which last longer than nature can, I mean s um, buildings and things which last for thousands of years. Um, there's, there's no doubt that if we, uh, if we take the, an appropriate measure of success, yeah, fine. Um, myself, I think probably the best measure of success is, will anybody notice when we've gone? Uh, and in other words, and, th and this is what nature has, I think, as its main criterion. You don't really notice. 
Uh, unfortunately, we're left with a legacy of nature's landfill, which is oil and coal. So that's basically nature's rubbish tip, and unfortunately we found it. But um, for the rest of it, um, you don't really notice where, um, where trees and things have been, uh, or an individual has been, it just gets subsumed into the rest. And I firmly believe that, um, well, biological materials are made out of just two polymers proteins and polysaccharides and there's a huge complexity within each of those two classes of polymer whereas we have 300 polymers or probably more and then you can start mixing and matching but I firmly believe that those two polymers have evolved as the ones that nature is made out of because they can be recycled so easily and so we shouldn't necessarily be thinking about what we can make we should be first of all saying what are we going to make it out of so that we can destroy it and use it for the next thing so this is the cradle to cradle philosophy I know but I think that there is um, there's more urgency there from even the biological perspective that recycling turns out to be the most important thing that nature does so that may be one of the ways in which you can measure success that's not the answer you're expecting, no, I know. No, the nature, it's, I mean, the nature, it's something that we could only achieve and we cannot go beyond that. So there is a Oh, no, 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 so no, 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 not at all, that? not at all. Um, nature is limited in the ways that it can distribute energy and use it. Um, it's limited by the speed at which it does things, which is partly related to the energy, but it's partly related to mechanics and making machines. Um, you, I mean, although you'll find answers within natural systems, you won't find the bits and pieces put together in the same way that we have them put together, simply because, as it were, um, like when you go into a shop and you say, have you got a so-and-so, um, and the guy in the shop says no, and you say, why not, and you, the person says, well, nobody ever asked for one. And a lot of the time, nature never asked for one. But that doesn't mean to say that we can't make it. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Julia. We can have a drink and we can further talk. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Yes. Right. Thank you. Well, thank you very much.